Oh, we'll try one more time. Good morning. <laughs> there you are. I'm glad you're here. Um, just before I launch into our, our teaching this morning, um, it doesn't take very much powers of observation uh, to be able to know that in our culture, lots of people struggle and they don't just get weary in life, they get weary of life. It can actually come to a place where um, they start thinking that they or others would be better off if their life ended. And tragically, there are lots of people who exercise that option. And, and so what we want to do is provide an opportunity. Um, on January the 28th, uh, we're having a suicide prevention seminar here. It's taught by Nick Costello, who has uh, some training in this uh, specific area. And the goal is uh, for us to be able to maybe notice when someone is struggling more than we realized. And maybe we could be a voice of encouragement or offer an option that they aren't aware of right now. And so if you would be interested in being one of those people who just learn some options that maybe you're unaware of, it'd be a great thing for you to participate in. You can sign up uh, out in the lobby on your way out. And uh, there's also a, a little card that was on your seat when you came in giving you information about that. We're in the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, uh, this is our 17th week in. And uh, we've been learning a lot about the beginnings, the origin story of Jesus and how he launched his ministry. And, and then uh, chapters five, six, and seven, he kind of identifies, uh, gives teaching about what the kingdom of God should look like. And in chapters eight and nine, he actually demonstrates power in God's kingdom, but a different kind of power than we're used to thinking about. And then uh, we get to this place and we're going to learn something about the mission of Jesus. And so we're in Matthew chapter nine, beginning in verse 35, and it said, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest. The passage starts by telling us that Jesus is moving, he's, he's going, he's, he's walking to various places. Jesus is on the move. A lot of times we're on the move, uh, not because we have a mission that we're on, we're just restless, or maybe we're bored. Uh, let's just check, does anybody get restless or bored? Yeah. How many are restless or bored right now? You know, if, if you wanna get up and just walk around the room while I'm talking, that's perfectly okay. All right. But Jesus is not just restless, he's, he's on a mission. And he goes to, it says, all the towns and the villages. This is interesting because villages are kind of rural and sometimes they don't even have a central location. It's just a collection of houses. That's the area where these people live. And, and he also goes to towns that there's no place too big or too small. That Jesus' mission is not limited by the number of people who reside in a place that he sees their needs and that's what motivates him to move towards them. And it says he's doing teaching and proclaiming. Teaching is, is presenting ideas, concepts, principles. And some of us are, are better than others at sitting in environments where someone is presenting ideas, concepts, and principles. In fact, we have a whole history of, of going to school and some of us did better than others and sometimes teachers were better than others. Like Sometimes we just locked in and they held our attention. Other times we just waited for the, 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 the period to be over. How many can remember when it felt like the clock, every single sentence, second was like an eternity? And... Uh, he teaches principles and ideas and concepts, but he also proclaims. And the idea of proclaiming is, is that it's an official declaration of something important. And so Jesus is, is going and, and he does something. He teaches and he heals. Why does he do this? Because both are needed. He teaches and he heals because both are needed. 
I think, honestly, if you ask most people, they would just say, well, you know, the teaching is nice, but what we need is, is healing. We need relief from pain. We need the, the dysfunction of my body to, to stop because, uh, and to be restored to its function because I can't get on with my life. But here's the thing that we often don't think about, and that is we have a kind of programming inside of us. There, there's a way that we tend to respond to certain things. There's a process, a filter by which we see the rest of the world. There, there's a way that we prioritize our energies and our resources. And what's true is, even if all of us were instantly in perfect health and everything was wonderful, the way we think about life might get us back to some places we would prefer not to go. So we need teaching. But there's other people. For them, it's all about the intellect. It's all about how much can you recall or remember and, and, and can you pass a test if somebody gives it and, and do you know how many books there are in the Bible and how many disciples there were and, and how many words that start with this. You know, people get into all the minutia of that. And for them, the physical thing is not as necessary, but this is what Jesus knows, is that having your intellect in the right place doesn't mean that you can do what it is that God has called you to do unless there comes healing to our physical being. And, and in the church, you will notice that churches tend to gravitate one direction or the other. They gravitate to more of the intellectual and academic pursuits of doctrine and of scripture, or they gravitate to the more physical nature of meeting needs that might be through social programs or healing of sick. And Jesus doesn't make that distinction. He does both. He teaches and he heals. How many are glad we have a savior who wants to give attention to all of our being and not just part of our being, yeah? I think that's really good. And, and so we have weaknesses and we have wounds that need to be healed. This is really interesting, though, is that when you look at the, the, the healings of Jesus, we tend to focus on the relief of pain or the restoration of function. And for Jesus, that's often an incomplete healing. Often at the end of a healing, you'll see Jesus say these words. He'll say, now... Go back to your family, or go back to your town, or go back to your friends, because your faith has made you whole. And for Jesus, until we are reconnected in relationship, our healing is incomplete. This idea that I just find relief from something that, that frustrates me, or that, that bothers me, or that slows me down, that's important to Jesus. But fully functioning bodies outside of relationships, Jesus considers to be an, an incomplete existence. And so he often restores them. This is, brings us to this point. Authentic spirituality is relational. Authentic spirituality is relational. It's not just a concept. A lot of people think about their faith in terms of these are the doctrines I subscribe to, or they think about it in terms of of practices. These are the, the routines that I attend, like maybe showing up at a place like this on a weekly basis or certain spiritual disciplines. I, I read this much of my scripture or I, I have a conversation with God this much uh, time each day or, or I engage in worship. And all of those are good and valid things. The, the point is not to in any way demean any of those. But if that's all there is to our faith, we're actually missing out on a very important thing because Jesus insists that our spirituality is not just the thoughts that we think or the actions that we take, it's the connections that we have. For him, spirituality is not just a concept, it's a community. When you, when you ask Jesus for the, to boil down to its elemental essence, what is, what is spirituality? He, he comes up with this. It's to love God. That sounds relational to me. And then to love others. That sounds relational to me. And, as, and what he says is, if you get those two things right, everything else comes out good. That for him, it's about relationship. So when we step into this text this morning, what we notice is that Jesus is motivated. He's on a mission. And what is it that motivates him? And this is fascinating. He says that he sees people, he sees the crowd, and what's interesting to me about Jesus is when he sees a lot of people, he still sees individuals. 
and, and he says they're harassed and they're helpless. What is he saying? Harassed. The, the word in the original Greek language actually means uh, skinned. It doesn't sound good. And uh, uh, what, it, what it implies is something that gets under your skin. So let's just check. How many so far this year have had something or someone get under your skin? <laughs> yeah. And what, what does that mean? They're agitated. They're frustrated. They're annoyed. Something is, 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 is irritating them, and it makes it very difficult to stay focused on the things that matter and very difficult to stay connected with other people. And, and it just takes sometimes one person knows exactly where our button is. How many have a person in your life? They know right where that button is. And, and, and you, you try to protect yourself. You brace yourself, you, you defend against, and somehow, like a ninja, they just swoop in and, and poke that button, and there you are, all annoyed and agitated. And, and if you work with people at all, you know what it's like, you know, if you're retail or something like that, and someone comes up to the counter, how, how often it, they'll ask you a question, and from your perception, this question is not something that you can answer, or it, it's a question that that ought to be obvious, and, and so you try to respond, and, and instantly they're annoyed. And I know some of you are going, yeah, that, I don't have to be in retail for that. My, my family's like that. I just, <laughs> you know. And, and our, our, our tendency is to look at them and say, why are you annoyed with me? I'm actually trying to help you. You know, I'm sorry for all the nasty little people you had to get through to get to me, but I'm actually the one who's trying to help you, so a little attitude adjustment would be useful. And, but we never think about what it could be like from them. They have fought through who knows what to get where they are, and they asked a question as, maybe even as impolite as it was, but what they're hoping is to find one single person today that can actually help them. And uh, our world isn't getting along very well right now, and a lot of that has to do with people who are harassed, and Jesus notices. Even in crowds of people, there's a way people move. There's a way they, they sound when they're agitated. And he says they're also helpless. This word is, is really interesting. It has to do with the idea of being thrown down, knocked down, and getting to the place where you're unwilling to get up anymore. It's not worth it. What difference will it make? I've tried. I'm tired of doing this anymore. And so people go down and stay down. Not because there's no physical strength left. It's just their will has been broken by the constant. Every time I get up, something else knocks me down. And when Jesus sees this, he sees people who are annoyed and frustrated and agitated. It doesn't make him annoyed, frustrated, and agitated. And when he sees people who've been knocked down so many times that they don't even want to get up anymore, he doesn't develop the attitude would come along. Why don't you just get your act together and get up on your two feet and maybe I can do something for you. We do not have a God who responds to our frustration with frustration and we do not have a God who responds to our helplessness by looking over us as though we are useless. How many are grateful we have a God that when he sees us like that, he has come Compassion on us. Compassion. Yeah. And it you literally uses the word compassion, which in, in the Latin it comes from two words, come, which means with, and passion, which means suffering. What it's saying is that Jesus, when you are suffering, he is suffering. That it breaks the heart of Jesus to see people who are barely making it. We get tired of those people. We get tired of being those people. And we start setting ourselves in a certain posture and approaching life in a certain way. And Jesus doesn't look like that at all. And so he says, what do they lack? They lack a shepherd. What does a shepherd do? A shepherd protects the sheep from predators because uh, sheep have really no defenses. 
They're not particularly agile. Some, I've heard some preachers say sheep bite. Those preachers actually didn't learn anything about sheep. Uh, sheep actually have no teeth on the top, just on the bottom. They just have a tough gum on the top. I'm not saying they couldn't pinch you, but it, <laughs> it's not like being bitten by a dog, let's say that. That they are at risk of not surviving. And when they wander, there's no one that seems to pursue them. And, and when they're broken, there's no one that knows what to do to promote health in them. And Jesus' heart is broken. He sees the same people you and I see, but he sees something different. He says, they're like sheep without a shepherd. This is the concern of Jesus. You want to know what motivates Jesus? This fascinates me. Jesus is not motivated to prove that he is right. Jesus is not motivated to get everybody to agree with him. Jesus is not motivated to try to get some position of authority and power so that everyone gives him the credit that he deserves. Jesus, you want to know what motivates Jesus? Every time he sees a frustrated person, and every time he sees a broken person, and every time he sees a wounded person, every time he sees a struggling person, he experiences is the hurt and the suffering that they're going through and he wants something better for them. How many know there's plenty of reason for Jesus to be motivated in our world and in our lives? That's what keeps him on mission. This is what he says. The harvest is huge, but there's hardly any workers. The harvest is huge. I have to say this, this, this verse... It, it frustrates me because a lot of the teaching that I've received in my life is, is that we have to go out and plant the seed to create the harvest, right? And this is not an anti-seed planting campaign. That's not the point. This is, uh, the harvest is huge. Jesus doesn't say, Pray for a harvest. He says, there's a harvest, and it's huge. The problem, the challenge, the lack is not the harvest. It's everywhere, as far as you can see. There's no shortage of people who need God and who need help. That's not the problem. The problem is there are hardly any workers. And this is fascinating to me. Jesus turns around and looks at his, at his followers. And they're here, you know, they're overhearing his conversation. They're, they're watching him process these crowds as they come towards him. And, and, and Jesus is saying all of these things. And what I expect Jesus to say is to turn around and say, okay, so you go there and you go there and you go there. And what Jesus knows is this little band of believers is not enough for the size of the crowd. He's done the math. And this is what's interesting about Jesus. We, why doesn't Jesus just wave his hand and heal everybody in the crowd? Why doesn't he just speak one word that encourages everybody? And this is what our world would prefer. A disengaged God who doesn't have to interact with us personally, but can make us feel better just by a hand wave or by saying a specific magic phrase. And that is not authentic spirituality to Jesus. Jesus absolutely refuses to accept a brand of spirituality where the individual doesn't actually matter. And so he knows they need to be restored in relationship and they need to have a relational connection and they need to be heard and they need to be touched and they need to be healed. And this is actually a very individual kind of thing. And so he says, Pray that the Lord or ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. This is interesting to me. Why? He doesn't say, Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out the movers, the shakers, the highly talented, the exceptionally qualified, the people who, who are especially gifted. He just wants workers. What do workers do? They bring the harvest from there to here. How many times do we limit ourselves because, well, I'm, I'm not good. Nobody wants to hear me sing. I can't teach a lesson. I'm too shy. I don't want to greet anybody. 
And we have all the reasons that we would disqualify ourselves. And Jesus just says, workers, people who roll up their sleeves. And, and he says, I want to pray the Lord of the harvest would send out workers. Now, this is really weird because he's going to use the same word send out in the next verse in chapter 10. In chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Jesus called his 12 disciples to them and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits. The word send out and the word drive out is the same word in the, English, or in the Greek language. And what does that mean? Like, why would Jesus use the same word? There must be a different word. And this is what I think about that. Um, I know for some people, the idea of an impure spirit um, dwelling within a host seems archaic, superstitious, and ignorant. Um, and I think most spiritual things do appear that way to lots of people within our culture. But what Jesus acknowledged is that there are, there are spiritual forces that not only want to control and inhabit us, but they actually make themselves comfortable when they do that. An impure spirit doesn't just get bored and leave. It requires something to compel it to leave. And Jesus is using that same language for sending forth workers into the harvest. We're comfortable where we are. If we're going to be sent into the harvest field, there's going to have to be something that compels us to move outside of our comfort zone. It's a really interesting wordplay. Let's continue on. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. It sounds like what he was doing. And then we go through a list of names. What's interesting here, other gospels tells us that, that Jesus, sent Jesus uh, sent his disciples out two by two. Matthew doesn't say that, but look at how he, he uh, uses these names. Uh, these are the names of the 12, and then he uses the word apostles. We'll come back to that in a minute. First, Simon, who is called Peter and and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector. Uh, I've got, well, I don't have time to talk about that. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and then Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who I'm sure was annoyed that he got paired up with Judas. You know, that was, why did you give me that guy? But here's, here's what's really interesting about that, is that throughout all of Matthew, uh, Jesus uses the word disciples for the 12. And here we see the use of the word apostles. And it's the only time in the Gospel of Matthew that the word apostles is used. And that word doesn't mean a spiritual hierarchy. What it does mean is sent. The people who follow me are going to go for me. It's a really interesting way. There's three gifts that Jesus gives in response to this huge harvest and hardly any workers. Three gifts. The gift of prayer. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. The gift of prayer. Why does that matter? because we have a voice and our voice matters in our world. And I know that there are a lot of people that will tell us that it doesn't. Your voice matters. Even if there are other people who don't listen to you, God always does. He gives the gift of authority because it, this isn't a position or a title. That's how we tend to think of authority. It's enfranchising you. It's giving you the right. You have a right to be there. You have a right to be where you are today. You have a right to your place in your home. You have a right to the place that you work. You have a right to the place in your neighborhood. A lot of times we feel like I don't belong here or I'm not appreciated here. And, and Jesus wants us to know you have the right to be there. And then he gives the gift of opportunity that at the end of the day, we'll have an option to see frustrated and hurting people. 
And when we see that, we'll have an option to respond. That God has seen them and he's not offended by them and he's not embarrassed with them. That when God sees the frustrated, annoyed and hurting people, his arms don't fold and his eyes do not look away. He doesn't see them all as a giant mass of people. Each and every individual. And the cry of our Savior today, there's so many of them. Pray. Use your voice. Ask God to send workers, not just the movers and the shakers, not the celebrity styles, not the ultimate attractive and the ultimate gifted. Don't, don't get me wrong, we'll take them too. That's not the point. This isn't a, if you're good at something, we don't want you. That, don't, get, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But to be able to move towards the frustration, not because we're frustrated, but because we have compassion. And here's what's fascinating with Jesus. If you share in his compassion, he will commission you, co-mission. We're on the same mission and he will give us all the authority we need and all the opportunity we can handle to be agents of his kingdom in our world. How many are glad for that opportunity? It's a real opportunity. Let's bow our heads. Uh, Father, uh, we get caught up in, in being annoyed with annoyed people and we get caught up in creating distance when we see hurting people because we feel like we don't know what to do. Would you help us lift our voice and ask you to send workers into the field and then will you help us receive the gifts that you offer to help us go. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.